gonna lie to you. But I'm just I'm doing this because I'm like, you know what? This period has forced my hand. Bro, yeah. listen, it's forced my hand to do loads of stuff like you see me as a person, yeah, I can't keep my backside still. Do you understand what I'm saying? So force me to make decisions that I was taking my time to make. Like yeah. because I've moved from Birmingham to South Wales. Right. I'm slowly doing it, but now with this lockdown thing, there's no one to look after my daughter, so I've got to be here, innit? So I'm making yeah. adjustments and the adjustments are all right, man. And like my mind is so much better than what it was in the city because yeah. Financially, I'm not spending so much. I'm not putting myself underneath so much pressure. Yeah. And, uh, I can just live a little, man, because as you know me as an athlete, as an old athlete, I always aim high. You understand mm. what I'm saying? It's coming from a single parent family. You know, mm. I'm watching my mom work three jobs and, you know, go out there and provide for me and my sister and my two little brothers. That's my motivation. That's my, that's my mindset. That's where my... my where my drive is in life and like I always try and do a little bit too much as you get older you know you have to slow down because the opportunities that are out there are no longer there because our time is no longer there especially with like 2004 stuff you know what we achieved in 2004 not saying it ain't never going to be achieved again but it ain't been achieved since and the way that we did it as underdogs breaks my heart that we don't get the love that we're supposed to get. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I don't want to put it into a race thing, but as for four black men from four different backgrounds to come together and achieve what we achieved, and we're competing against each other on a daily basis, Mm. but we had the same mindset to come together and to say, you know what? I'm not going to allow no one to tell us that we can't achieve this medal. Because Mm. we we're not the best in the world, but we can put people under pressure to achieve the best in the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Fam, we- you know, you know, like I didn't want to cut you because I want you to tell that story, but I'm coming out in goosebumps. Like, I'm gonna keep it hundred because like that that four by one two thousand and four Athens, mate, like I was only two years into the game as a journalist myself, right? I wasn't there, so I didn't get to go to that Olympics. I didn't even know how to apply for Olympics. The whole process, I got involved in the, in the, in sports journalism in 2002. And 2003, I done my world indoors in Birmingham. That was my first major world outdoors in Paris. And I was like, yeah, I'm in. You get me? We go Olympics. Little did I know, the whole accreditation process stops two years before. Mm. So I was like, ah, what missed out? So I couldn't even go to Athens. I was mad vexed. But that race was the same day as my auntie's, um, my auntie's wedding. Okay. okay. And, and I was, I never, because she had big screens all around the hall and like everyone was doing speeches and whatnot. And I peeled off, but I was doing a madness when he was coming down that home straight. I, like I was absolutely doing a madness when he was coming down that home straight. But when you crossed the line, I felt like I crossed the line. It was just, yeah. because I knew the story that went behind it. Bro, this is what yeah. I want you to talk about. Yeah. The whole switching of, because this is, to me, this is the movie moment when, yeah. when, uh, What's his name? <laughs> 200 meters. Christian Malcolm. Yeah, when he couldn't compete because of the, the kidney or the viral infection. Yeah, yeah. Kid, and who was it coming? Marlon coming. Who coming on the well, top Well, the team, the team yeah. originally was Marlon, Darren, um, Jason, Christian, myself, yeah. Yeah. Nick Smith. Yeah, we mm. were the we were the six man. So when Christian got ill, they bought in Dwayne Grant. Mm. So Dwayne Grant was was our six man, but had a very good potential in running because he was a good caliber. He was a good two hundred meter runner. So let's take you back to two thousand and three, Paris World Championships, where I ran in the heat of the World Championship relay final. I mean, semi-final, and it felt natural. We qualified for the final. Then they, then they bought in Dwayne Chambers, politics. They bought in Dwayne Chambers. No disrespect to Dwayne. I love Dwayne. He's my man. You understand? I got nothing but love for him. Me and him had some good years, some good, good years. But obviously, we all know the history, which kind of put me in a situation where I showed them in Paris what I could do. So... 
my last leg was not questionable because me and Marlon had it down to a T. I trained with him with, um, no, I didn't train, I didn't move to London at that point. But we was doing a lot of relay practice. And like, it got to a point where he'd shut hand and my hand would just be in the right place. So it got to a situation where I kind of knew after the 100 meters that I still got hope to be in the four by one. But when they announced the team, I was like, yes. But you got to remember, Darren had a hamstring problem. Mm. Massive hamstring problem. So we had a lot of problems within the team. But because we all knew how important it was to us as individuals to go out there and to prove that we're not underdogs, we're competitors, and we can go out there and we can do the thing, which we did, for me, the best moment in my life. Do you understand what I'm saying? In sport. Best moment in my sport in, in my sport in life. Just to go out there and, and to actually achieve my ultimate goal, which is the Olympic gold medal. Best moment in my life. And it's just, it's just a shame that the story is not really being told in the way from our perspective. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, you're, you're right. It's definitely... Uh, uh, it, 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 the main protagonist, obviously, the four people that were in the race, and we'll always remember them. But like you said, it's Crystal Malcolm's story in the background. Mm -hmm. There's those that were called up, the Nick Nurses, Dwayne Grants and all that. Um, and it being the year after, obviously, what happened with Dwayne Chambers, um, there was huge spotlight on on the team and Maurice Green was still Maurice Green. So there were so many different elements to that story that just made it absolutely one of the most fantastic Olympic moments. Um, staying on the Olympic kind of theme, obviously, you, you, you touched on how disappointing it must be for athletes. Um, or well, the pros and the cons of it being postponed for a year, yeah. given what's going on with COVID-19. You touched on that in the chat room interview we did with The Voice newspaper. But for this one, what I want to I wanna home in on is some of the Olympic stories. Like, that year in Athens was clearly, that was, you weren't in Sydney, were you? Because they left you out. I remember that was all politics, yeah. whether you could go to Sydney or not. Bearing so in mind, you went Edmonton in 99, right? I went Edmonton and ran 9.97. And yeah. then there was drama. It was like, should we select him? Shouldn't we? He's too young no, for Sydney, no, no, right? No. The story behind Sydney was I qualified at the trials in Birmingham. And then my coach and I sat down and he put the cards on the table. And it was my, Steve Platt was the realest guy I've ever met in my whole life. The realest. He said, listen, Mark, would you rather go to the World Junior Championships and know that you can come on with a medal or go to Sydney and get drawn up into all that politics that was happening. Because if you remember Sydney, there was a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of guys for the relay and the guys for the 100 metres, they did all right, but they never really lived up to where they supposed to. You understand what I'm saying? So hmm. for me, it was always natural to go to the World Junior Championships and take the natural progression. There was no real rush for me to go to the Olympics in 2000. You understand what I'm saying? I would have been one of the youngest guys to compete in the Olympics. And in the 100 metres with the likes of Maurice Green, you know, Chambers. Um, I would have been, been a semi-finalist. And then I would have... Even Darren at the time as well. Darren, so. Darren Campbell. I wouldn't have been mm. able to um, sign my Nike contract, mm. which enabled me to become a full-time athlete, um, be financially independent, you know, give my coach something for his commitment, you mm. know, um, and 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 just just be that, that athlete. Do you understand what I'm saying? And... I'm kind of glad I did that because for me, that was the right platform. Sydney for me was never on the cards. It was just, it was just a situation where I qualified for it and I ran a quick time and they was looking to take me. But I always knew four years time, four years after that, that would be my time. Because I, was, I think I was 21 in Athens. So, you know, naturally I was in prime, prime shape. And um, yeah, so... That's the story behind Sydney. It was never a situation where there was Omin and Ari to take me or not. It was my decision not to go. I wasn't interested. And a lot of people said, oh, that's the wrong decision. You should have went. You don't know if you'll ever make an Olympics again. I ended up winning a gold medal four years later on. It wasn't in the 100 metres, but it was definitely in Athens. You know, I messed up. I messed an up. Olympic gold is an Olympic gold, my G. Like, I'm just yeah, saying. Course. I'm like, from a council estate in Birmingham. You know what I come mean? Come on, come that, on. For come me, on. that was... I don't care what anyone says. That's a massive achievement, you know? And like, for me to be the first one in my family to, to, to win an Olympic gold and to be honoured by the Queen, I'm, I'm all right. Do you know what I mean? And like, my kids have got something to aspire to. So, yeah. 
Talk about the Olympics, man. Olympic stories. What was it like rocking up in Athens just as a freshie to an Olympic Games? What was you observing? What was you like, wow? What was you like, oh, okay. What, what, what was that like? Talk about that. For me, it's special, isn't it? Because that's where it all started, isn't it? And I'm, I'm kind of spiritual with things like that. You understand what I'm saying? So I just, in, I just soaked up all the atmosphere, the Olympic Games, the village, the accommodation, people around me. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. It, it, it felt like a dream. So for you to say, what was it like? It's hard for me to explain that because I lived in the moment. Mm. When you're in an Olympic village, you're in a bubble. You don't know you're there until you stand on the track and you're soaking and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Do you know what I mean? Because to stand, to walk out into an Olympic stadium and to see, what, 40, 50,000 people, mm. it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming, you know, uh, and like for every athlete, that's that's the high point. That's that's the goal of that. That's the ultimate goal. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, for me, when I went out there and I didn't quite do the thing in the hundred meters, I was devastated. I was heartbroken. Mm. I went going back to my to my to my room and you know giving my mum a call and just saying to her, I, I I think I let you down. Like you know, um, I didn't make it into the final. I didn't perform to the best of my ability. And she said, listen, sir, yeah, you've got the four by one relay coming up. Yeah. It don't matter about where you placed yourself in the hundred meters, because I know that you tried your best. Yeah. And I know that you went out there and you did the best that you could do on that day. She said, go out there with your head held up high because I'm proud. Yeah. So go out there and enjoy the relay with the rest of the guys. And look what happened. The mummy boost there, yeah. <laughs> you get that little feeling in your belly. I thought, you know, you know that what? mummy boost. Yeah, I don't need to hear not enough nobody else. Yeah, car. Mm. And when you get that kind of certif, um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, I know what you mean. That them yeah, powers yeah. and motivation. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, that little motivation from being heartbroken to you know what? Yeah. Yeah, my mum just spoke her words and I don't business about nothing else now. I'm going to go pick up my spikes. I'm going to go to relay practice. And I'm going to go out there and do my thing. And I remember sitting in the final call room with, with Darren and Jason and Marlon. And I remember saying to them, if you give me the baton in first place, I'm not letting nobody pass me. And it, it happened. Morris Green was on my tail. It was on you. It was on you. It was on my tail. And... You know, Morris Green was the equivalent to Usain Bolt back then. Yeah, I got a lot of love and respect for Morris Green because I idolised him as a mm. young athlete coming up, you know, and um, his craft was next to none, you know. Uh, so for me, as a young, a young athlete coming through and to hold off Morris Green, that deleted everything that happened in 100 metres for me. And I was like, you know what? I gained a lot of confidence from that afterwards. What, were there any funny moments off track for you during that during that that whole Olympics that you want to share? Like I can see that smile, bro. <laughs> I no, see no, that no. smile. Like for me, like there's a whole heap of funny moments, but you know, this is one of them, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> cool, say no more. If that was a high first time in the Olympics, Athens of oh wait, Beijing. Oh wait, Beijing. Mm. That was the biggest low for me. You I know? see. I, I, I didn't want to say it, but yeah, yeah that was the biggest low for me. I was in the shape of my life. I moved from mm. Birmingham to London. I trained with um, the likes of Tim Benjamin, Marlon Devilish. I was coached under Tony Lester. Um, Tony Lester was probably one of the first coaches that showed me what hard work was. You know, um, and I was that athlete that was naturally talented. Do you know what I mean? I didn't really have to work too hard to achieve my goals. But I got to a point in my life where metabolism slows down, body weight, you got to be a professional athlete. And I was at a point in my life where I was out of my comfort zone. I couldn't just drive down the road and go sit down with my mom or be around my, my real people that I grew up with. I was in London, you know, on the outskirts of London with new people. Um, and I couldn't just break away. So every day was training, 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 training. And I was in the shape of my life, you know, um, I remember being out in um, Cyprus with, with the guys on a warm weather training camp. And I was having some problems with my kiddies beforehand, but it was always a situation where it was 
it's all right, man. You'll get through. You'll get through. You'll get through. And I remember getting into the blocks with Marlon, pushing out as hard as I possibly could and just hearing a pop. And me being as ignorant as I am, I thought, ah, oh, it's all right. A couple of weeks and I'll be back to normal. But I was flew home straight away. And um, I had a meeting with a guy in central London called Dr. Hocken. Um, and he sat me down in a room and says, your season's done. And the first thing that happened, that's like crying. Yeah. The amount of hard work that you put into it, the amount of sacrifice that you put into it, is just gone in an instant. So for me, it was heartbreaking, you know. Um, so my Olympic dream of 2008, where I wanted to put right what I did wrong in 2004, it was never going to happen, you know. And we all knew four years after that, I'd be a little bit too old to even challenge the up-and-coming new kids. So... For me, in my head, it was like my career was over, and it? it was done. So I came back home. Um, I did the relevant work that I needed to do, rehab work. Um, I got my, and my Achilles into a good place where I could start to walk. It took about eight months for me to start to walk again. And um, in that time, I put a little bit of weight on. Um, and it was a situation where my relationship broke down with my coach at the time. And um, I just felt like I wasn't getting supported. You know, my Nike contract was up. Financially, it was I was in a bad place because I was spending money on my lifestyle, training, nutrition, and I weren't getting no support. So for me, it was a situation where I had to make a conscious decision on what, what I needed to do. So I decided to leave Tony, and um, I had a meeting with Linford. And um, at the time, my manager was Ricky Sims from Pay Sport Management. You know, uh, and I sat down with him and I said, this is the decision that I want to make. You know, I got a lot of love for Ricky because he definitely supported me with every decision that I made. You know, uh, like he was more of a best friend than an agent. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, he understood. He had an understanding of me. Cause he was yeah. on age. Um, so to this very day, man, I got a lot of love for him, man. I got a lot of love for, for mm. him. So I made the conscious decision to sit down with Linford and... Uh, say to him that I want him to be my coach. Um, and I think for me, that was the shining light, man. You know what I mean? 2009, I came out because I was putting my right Achilles under so much strain. I had a partial rupture in that. So 2009 season for me was, not too I think the fastest time that I ran in 2009 was um, 10.6 or something like that. And then, you know, Twitter and all the rest of you people were writing me off. But as a, a mentor and a, a motivator, Linford is the man because we knew 2010 was approaching. Again, I worked really hard. You know, the stuff that I learned with Tony about sacrifice, reward, working hard, I took all that over to Linford. And Linford, again, he's a beast when it comes to, when it comes to training. You know, Ron Rodden, who was Linford's coach, again, I was guided by him as well. And, um, they, 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 they definitely resurrected me from the death, from, from, from deep down. You understand? Yeah. Mentally, physically, they brought me back, um, and I was able to come out in 2010 and have a good start to the season. I think I ran 6:58 indoors, um, and then I came out and had a good opener, um, and about 10, 10, 4, 10, 10, 3, and then it just started to get better and better and better. I remember the time where we had the European Championships in Barcelona. Um, and I didn't make the 100-meter individual, but I was on the cards to be the third man. And I just remember being out in uh, Portugal, in the holding camp. And I was training with Linford on the back straight, and Lloyd um, came over to me and he went, you're looking good, you know? But because I wasn't really focused on... Other people, I was focused on myself and my coach. I weren't, I weren't really soaking in the information. Do you know what I mean? And the way I was conducting myself, keeping myself to myself, was training hard. And I got um, Charles Van Colony walked over to me and he went, I'm going to give you that third spot. You know when you just feel like welling up and crying? That's mm. how I felt, man. And I thought, you know what? <clears throat> there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. I remember saying to him, I won't let you down. Thank you for this opportunity. And he went, it's all right, man. Just make the final. Mm. Make the 
quite that good enough for me. I want to try and get a medal in this. You're just giving me an opportunity. Mm. Again, going back to where I'm from, you're giving me an opportunity. I'm going to make sure I get to the highest level in it. You know, so I remember going to Barcelona, speaking to Linford all the way through it, taking it round for round. I remember being in the semi-final with La Metra. I remember thinking, why are you weren't that far away, you know? <laughs> you know? This is the guy that's supposed to be the guy and he wasn't that far away. And I thought, you know what? What have I got to lose? I made the final. I made the final, but I think it was 0 0.01 of a second. One of the fastest losers. I was given lane two. I always remember this. I had the Italian, Carlio, next to me. Then it was me. Then it was Chambers. And the way I, I, the way I, I am as a person, I said to myself, Dwayne can start. If you can get out with Dwayne, you know the second part of your race is the strongest part of your race. And that's all I kept thinking about. And your marks get set. I got out with Dwayne Chambers. I thought, yes. I went blank. I can't remember nothing else. <laughs> I ran in towards the line and just dipping my chest forward and thinking, I got third place. I know I got a medal. And it was, again, the Olympic feeling all over again. Being that underdog and coming out and achieving mm. you know, in something that somebody just ripped you off in. And I remember just looking up at the board and when, when they said silver medal, I was like, no way, no way. First person I went to was Linford. And I said to him, this is where you won your Olympic gold medal. And this is where you resurrected my career. Do you understand? One of the proudest moments in my career. A lot of people, 2004 was, but 2010 for me was the year of um, belief, you know? Mm. Mm. And that's the message that I try and put out there. Do you know what I mean? The sky's the limit. And if you want to achieve something, it don't matter how many times you get knocked down. It don't, mean, it don't matter how many times people say it's impossible. As long as you believe in your mind's eye that you can go out there and you can achieve your ultimate goal, there's nothing on this earth that can stop you. And again, with all these athletes out there getting ready for the Olympics and it's being postponed, just keep your mind right and you can still go out there and achieve your ultimate goal. Because that's what this life is all about. It's all about going out there and doing the unbelievable, the unthinkable, you know. Um, and I think my whole career was kind of based on that. And then, as you know, later on that year, I was able to go to Delhi and then achieve another silver medal in the 100 metres and then a gold medal in the 4 by one And I think I got to a point where I thought to myself, yeah, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. There's nothing else for me to prove to, to myself. There's nothing else for me to prove to anybody, um, I'm done, I've had enough. And um, I carried on for the next two years just to do the rounds and the circuits and kind of pan out what I needed to do after sport. Do you know what I mean? And um, in 2014, I decided to call it a day. Uh, went to Glasgow Commonwealth Games, you know, um, the next wave of very young and talented sprinters were coming through. And I thought, yeah, this is my time just to fade away and call it a day. And um, I was fortunate enough to, to get the opportunity to compete in bobsleigh. So that's the route that I went down. And uh, it, for me, it's not something that I enjoyed doing, but it kind of weaned me off athletics, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it was, a good, it was a good segue out of sport, I guess. Yeah, yeah. definitely, mm. definitely. Because athletics is very addictive. You know, sometimes you don't know when to let go. But mm. for me, I think I let go at the right time. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the story, the story is, is definitely thicker than what we've just scraped on, you know, uh, Barcelona just before the 100 meter final, me and Linford did no walk, no warm up. We did, <laughs> we did one lap of the track. Wow. One lap of the track. And then he wow. said, go over there and go close your eyes and just relax. And what I did when I went into the corner on the physio bed and closed my eyes, I must have raced the race a thousand times in my mind. And then, bam. That's what, that's what happened in the end. I knew what Lena was going to be in. I knew who was next to me. I knew what I needed to do. And I raced the race a thousand times in my mind. I was good. So it just goes to show sometimes less is more. Mm. And, you know, as Linford Christie, you know, he always says, eat or be eaten. So I had to eat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, um, you know, it's funny because uh, yeah, I, I guess coming back from a effectively a double Achilles, yeah, would probably rank as one of your greatest achievements, isn't it? So I definitely. What definitely. what what was the what was the lowest point during that rehab though? Because obviously you rehabbed one and then done the other. So how was that mentally? We all know what the lowest point is in athletics. Communication and people that are supposed to be your people. Do you know what I mean? It was a dark, lonely time, you know? Wow. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. And like, like I said, the people that were there for me are the people that I still speak to today. Do you understand what I'm saying? And yeah. I'm, I'm not the type of dude that surrounds myself with a lot of people anyway, but it just, it showed me entering a stage a stage in my life that nothing's forever nothing mm. is permanent you know always be willing to move on to the next do you understand what i'm saying mm. like <clears throat> your place is not guaranteed and that's what and that's what and, and that's what being injured showed me you know when you're getting up and you're jumping on the bike and you're doing a couple of hours on the bike and then you're coming back home and, you, you know, your social life isn't where it needs to be because you're focusing on the job in hand and your mental state is, am I good enough to get back? You know, have a to get back? You know, um, you know, the only person that I really had 100%, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Trust in was Steve Platt, who is no longer, who was no longer with me at that time, you know? Uh, and for me, I was kind of lost then, and I had to kind of find my own way. And yeah, he was with you from, from when you were young though, right? The original yeah, coach, right? From the age of 13 <laughs> all the way to the age of, I think it was 21. I, mm. I, left, I left Birmingham in 2004 and started, well, I moved to London, well, just on the outskirts of London in 2005. So for me, he knew me and it, Martin Lewis Francis, you know, the guy that was bad in school, the guy that needed sport to calm down, the guy that needed a bit of guidance. He knew me. So for me to put any trust into anybody else like that, it was hard. You know what I mean? Because you know what the game's all about. It's about someone making a little bit of money out of someone else. Do you know what I mean? And being associated with someone else so, so they can get the credibility to, to to boost their own whatever they need to boost. Do you know what I mean? Um, but the only person close to that was LC. Do you know what I mean? Because he just kept it 100. Do you know what I mean? He he loves he loves athletics that much. Yeah. He never asked me for nothing. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You know what I mean? Apart from turn up and train. And but that I got a lot of love for him for. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that. That's one thing that I, I I don't see celebrated as much or as often as it should be. The fact that Christy, despite the fact that the sport has. I said, no, I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to say what it is. Despite some sections of the sport seeing him as a fly in the ointment, mm. as opposed to somebody that should be celebrated on all levels. Of course, of course. Um, I've always like, been... I think it's, it's a crying shame because yeah. at the end of the day, anybody that, let, let he without sin cast the first stone, innit? You get what I'm saying? Everybody who wants to cast aspersions um, ain't without, you know, you've, you've done your ish in your life. You've done your dirt whatever that may be, and whether it had come to light or not. You get what I'm trying to say? So I don't know sometimes how his contribution to the sport, even though he's not embraced by certain... And I, I know he doesn't care about this. You know, yeah, he's, 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 he don't care. That's how much he loves the sport. And that's mm. pretty much the point I'm trying to get to. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It's not even the sport, it's people. You know what I mean? If he, if he, know, he, if, if he knows that he can help you, mm. then he's got, he's got your back. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and like, again, I was in a situation financially where I was on my ass, you understand? And he could have said, why, if you want to come and join my group, it's, it's X, Y, Z a month. He didn't do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and for me, like you said, he's not celebrated enough because for me as a young, young black guy growing up and seeing him on the TV, that inspired me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, where? We can we can achieve. You understand what I'm saying? And like, he's still he's still sacrificing time today. He's still going out there and coaching athletes and believing in people and getting people to their full potential. And again, I just think it's a shame that he ain't celebrated in the way that he should be. You know what I mean? What other athletes inspire you? You've mentioned Christy, 
Yeah. Lymph, lymph, um, Maurice. Who else? Yes. Oh, it's got to be um, Donovan Bailey, isn't it? I remember being in Edmonton and Donovan Bailey, big, big Donovan Bailey coming over to me, putting his arm around me and saying, you've got it, you know. <laughs> and you got to remember, at that age, I don't know what he, I don't know what he meant by you, Gully. I'm just going through. I'm turning up to training. I'm standing behind the start line. And I'm going to the finish line before anybody else. That's all it was for me. A lot of people were right. I didn't appreciate what I had as a young athlete. But well, you got to remember where I'm coming from. I'm coming from nothing. No respect to my parents, you understand? But I'm legitly coming from nothing. So to be in Edmonton, in a hotel, to race in the World Championships, that's massive. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if people knew the real reason why I started athletics, they'd have a better understanding. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so Donovan Bailey to come over to me, a guy that I watched in Atlanta win his Olympic gold medal, and say that to me was massive, you know, massive. I remember running sub-10 in the heats and then running 10-3 in the semi-final and walking out to the stadium and then he's put his arm around me. I got that picture at home, at my mom's house, you know. He put his arm around me and he went, don't worry about it, man, you got plenty of time. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I, I remember was, you. Know, I remember when the camera cut to you when you never got that time and you never got that sub-time, right? Because... You look so hurt, bro. <laughs> you look so hurt. You look really yeah. And all, I remember watching the TV, thinking to, I, I can't remember what I was doing, but saying to the man, yeah, because like, imagine the sponsorship if like, that was yeah. right, fight. Do you get what I'm saying? It would have been, it must have had a big check attached to it. It will happen because my night contract that I, that I received after the World Junior Championships was all right. You know what I mean? And you got to remember, I never started athletics for financial gain. It was never about financial gain. It was mm. always about being on the right path. Do you mm. understand what I'm saying? It was always about doing something with your life. It was never, ever about financial gain. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Don't get me wrong. I was able to look after my family. I was able to support myself in my journey. It was never, ever about money. Do you understand? Don't get me wrong. We all like materialistic things, like a nice car, a nice home, yada, yada. But Motorbikes that, in your case. You still yeah. getting bikes, bro? Oh, I still got my bike. That's my, that's my, that's my passion. You know what I mean? But... Um, for me, as a youngster coming from where I came from, it was always about stability. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I was able to give myself stability, you know, um, and provide stuff for my kids that what I went through, they would never have to go through. Do you understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, still apply the same morals. Do you understand? I'm not going to just give you. I want you to work and then I'll I help you. Or, you know... Yin and yang, because that's that's the kind of background that I'm from. My mother would never ever put nothing in my hand and say, Hey, take this. She'd never do that. She'd always say, You come halfway and I'll meet you halfway. And that's how I was able to grow as a young man. Do you understand? Because we we fell upon some hard times as as a young family. You know what I mean? Like when I was living with my parents, my mum and, you know, seeing my dad every now and again and, you know, this and that. It, it, it was tough for us. You know what I mean? So what athletics gave for me was guidance, hope, experience, made me see the world, made me come back home and appreciate what we got. Do you understand? Because as you know, it's not all glamorous and it's not all nice. You go to some places, like I trained in South Africa and I'm a man that I can't sit in my hotel. Yeah, I'm going to make friends with the cook and then go to the cooks where he lives and then look around and go, yeah, I get it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you come home and you live your life a little bit different. That's me as a person, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I think that's what athletics gave for me. It gave me a, um, a wider birth, a wider eye, you know, to see that we ain't got it that bad. Do you know what I mean? Mm. With, that, with that wider eye then, my brother... It's been good going through the years. How would you like to influence the sport moving forward then? How would you like to use those years of experience to help the next gen or just help the sport on whatever level? Just don't take it for granted. You know? Use, use whatever platform you got to, to not just help yourself, to help anybody underneath you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you'd, you'd like to help people understand that? 
Is yeah, yeah, most definitely because it's a short career, isn't it? And like it goes so quick. What we're talking about, what three Olympic cycles and then that's it. Mm. It's, it's a very quick career, and you know, I could go there, but I don't really want to go there. But the athletes, the tools in this, do you understand what I'm saying? But we're the important tools that keep the cogs turning. Don't get me wrong, there's a selective few that will always be okay. You understand what I'm saying? But there's there's more than enough that's had good experiences that are just thrown to the waistline. Do you understand what I'm saying? And not used in the right kind of way. So the retirement scheme, like what what is there? Because I had I had to find my own way. You know what I mean? And it was it wasn't easy. And you know, we all know like in football there's a there's there's um uh, what do you want to call it again? It's support for former pro- professionals. Yeah, of course. And mm. we all know the, the the route of media or TV or radio, yeah. the natural route. But what if you're mm. a person like me that you don't really want to do the radio and you don't really want to do the TV? You want to be hands-on and you want to be in the schools, finding the next talent, opening up academies, you know, uh, and guiding real talent to get onto that platform. We know we've got the club system, but the club system, it's, 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 it's sometimes hard for kids to get into the club system because now I know there's a massive waiting list for Birchwood Highlanders. Some people just ain't got the time to wait. You know, mm. about the ages of 14 to 18, they're the crucial ages where you're leaving school to go to college. That there is the crucial area where you've got to guide, you've got to guide our young our young people. <coughs> So, so you think basically there's more scope for you guys to, you former pros and especially pros of your ilk who have won medals on uh, every championships, every level. You think there's more scope for there to be more of a joint effort between you, British athletics, the sport as a whole. That's not being executed right now. Oh, most definitely. Because you got to remember we speak the language of most of the youth that are out there. Yeah, true. Especially if we're coming from the same place where they're coming from. Mm. I see a lot of talented young kids that just financially can't do it. You know what I mean? I was very lucky to get a deal at a very young age to make me be a professional athlete. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's young kids out there that has to get a job. Once they leave school and certain money stops, they have to get a job. Mm. If they don't get a job, they turn to whatever they need to turn to, which is mm. causing the problem on the streets today. So, I don't know. I don't know. Is the sport big enough to deal with that? I don't know. We're talking about finding the next Mo Farah, finding the next Usain Bolt, finding the next Mark Lewis Francis. Mm-hmm. Has Birmingham produced another sprinter like me? I don't know. Well, not not as yet. So we're still waiting, I guess. Still waiting, man. But it's been a long time. I retired in 2014. I know there's young kids out there doing their thing. Mm-hmm. You got to remember. I ran sub-10 at the age of 18. I represented my country at the age of 15. Annecy, 1998. World Junior Championships. Watching Christian Malcolm win them two gold medals definitely inspired me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Being around different people, being off my council estate, watching Denise Lewis, Dwayne and Adejo, you know, Shea Hansen train, at Birchwood Harriers, it inspired me. There's more to life than just getting up and being on road. Do you understand what I'm saying? And yeah. like people like myself, and I know there's a whole bunch of other athletes out there that could definitely be doing the same thing, but no one's willing to open doors for us. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's to a bright future, my brother, and hopefully more bright careers, bright, as bright as yours, where the Olympics have been. It's yeah. been good chatting. You've been the first first athlete through the virtual mix zone, so thanks for that. No, I appreciate, um, it. appreciate it. We've got lots to do. There's going to be a lot more work coming in the future. Um, people should get used to seeing your face about, well, in connection with anything I do anyway. So I appreciate your time, brother, and continued success. I know you're struggling at home with the, the isolation and the quarantine, but yeah. we'll get for it, bro. We've been through tougher times. So, no, so, no, yeah. no. That's what I keep telling myself, you know, like, it's not really a bad time, you know, meditation, mm. reset. It's the big reset button. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's where we're at, man. But mm. 
Definitely. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, man. If anyone's watching that's struggling, being in their house. Brighter days are coming, bro. Right. Respect, my brother. Appreciate right. your time, yeah? Right. Always, man. Let's go. Right.